if you care to follow along with the scripture reading, will be 2 Peter 3, 9 and 10. 2 Peter 3, 9 and 10. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. It's a blessing to be with you this morning. I'd like to uh, welcome you once again to our worship service here at Northwest, especially any that might be visiting. We're delighted that you've chosen to be with us this morning. I hope you have an outline uh, for, the, for this morning's lesson. And as you will see this morning, we're going to be dealing with uh, the topic of evangelism. And I want to say that I'm deeply honored uh, that, that I get to speak to you on, on this subject. Uh, and just as a side note, as most of you know, Garrett and his family, they're away on vacation, so we need to remember them in our prayers as well for safe travels. So we think about evangelism. Most of you um, are aware, anybody that has been a part of a different congregation uh, before you've come to Northwest, you realize that there's something unique about this congregation. About the, about the Back to the Bible campaigns that we participate in. And not just that, just the overall interest in saving souls. And I want to say once again, publicly, how much I love you for that. And I pray uh, that you, you never run out of a desire uh, to save those that are lost. As, as you know, the campaign is approaching. And the elders have asked that uh, a sermon be, be preached over evangelism as we're gearing up and we're thinking about uh, the efforts, the work that lies ahead of us, not just on campaign, but each and every day of our lives. Before we dive into the, into the scripture, I, I want to share with you a, a brief story about a, about a young girl named Lisa. Uh, Lisa was, I guess you could call her your, your typical, stereotypical teenage girl. Uh, Lisa didn't enjoy doing a lot of the things that her parents wanted her to do. And that included uh, coming to the worship service. Uh, she didn't like coming, and every time she came, she would, tell, she would tell her dad, I'm not even listening to what the preacher says. I'm not listening uh, to what the Bible school teacher has to say. I'm just not interested in those things. But her dad said, well, you're coming anyway. Well, as she graduated high school and she left the house, uh, sure enough, she, she didn't return uh, to the church. A few years later, she got married to a man who also was not a Christian. They had children. And after they had children, some members of the congregation, including Lisa's father, and the congregation that Lisa grew up attending, they, they started coming and wanting to study with her, wanting to talk with her more about not just her own soul, but the souls of her children, and how important it would be for her to give her life to Christ. Eventually, Lisa obeyed the gospel. And a few years after that, so did her husband. So I think about that short story. Maybe some of you can tell some, some that are very similar to that. I, I fight to hold back the tears because I just told you about my parents. I told you about my, my mother who, who wanted nothing to do with the church. I told you about, about my father who, who grew up and he had no relation to the church. And he was one that, as he would tell you, that he used to go around and be antagonistic towards the church. It wasn't just that he didn't go. He, he seemed to have a, a level of disdain for anybody who did. And there was a group of people who loved their souls. And I'm convinced because of that group of people, I'm standing right here today. There's a very special place in my heart for those who love somebody enough to bring the gospel to them and to share it. I want to encourage you this morning. I also want to challenge you a little bit. As we think about evangelism and what it is that, that we really need to know. Well, what it is that we really need to understand. Number one on your outline, I just have two points for you this morning. So hopefully it will be easy to remember. Number one is this. We need to understand that evangelism is not dead. It is not dead. Whenever I was growing up, maybe some of you can uh, relate to a few of these scenarios. I, I became extremely discouraged with evangelism. I became extremely dis discouraged with evangelistic efforts. I had a, a best friend of mine. His name was Bill. Uh, Bill and I did everything together. We worked out together. We uh, went to the gym together. We, we uh, played in band together. He came to my house. I went to his house. We were running buddies. He used to come to uh, worship with me in Blanchard. 
And he, he came several occasions, and then it became obvious to him that there were some things that were different about how he had been uh, being brought up in the congregation that he attended of a local denomination. And so the time came, we opened up our Bibles, and I started sharing a few scriptures, and you probably already know where this is going. Bill ended up being pretty offended. He was very offended with some of the things that I was trying to share with him, and uh, to, to this day, we really, don't, we really don't speak as a result of that. I began thinking about another friend of mine by the name of Michael. I played football with Michael, very similar s scenario. Uh, he had come to me asking some questions because he knew that I, I went to church and he wanted to ask me some things. And we would sit down and we would start talking and before I knew it, Michael wasn't wanting to be around me very much anymore. I think about one of my uncles who used to be one of my biggest uh, cheerleaders in life, uh, you might say. He was always there to tell me what a great job I was doing. Uh, well, this uncle was of a different religious group, and the time came for me to preach my first sermon at the Blanchard congregation, and he came to listen to me. And I, I remember waiting to hear what he had to say, as I assumed he would continue his trend of telling me what a great job I did. Unfortunately, that's not what he did. He began to tell me all the things he disagreed with that I had said, and still to this day, that, this particular uncle doesn't really want to speak to me. I began reflecting on some of those scenarios in my life and thinking of how discouraged I was with the, the entire concept of evangelism and thinking to myself, nobody wants to hear about Jesus. Nobody wants to hear about truth. Nobody wants to hear about structure. Nobody wants to hear what God's plan is for their life. And I convinced myself at an early age that evangelism more or less was, was a dead art that it didn't exist anymore. I don't know all of your backgrounds, all of your stories. Maybe you have been there. Maybe you're there today. Maybe that's something, that's an idea that you have within your mind, but I want you to understand something very clearly this morning. Evangelism is not dead. I want to share a few examples. This is from last summer of our campaign down in San Angelo. I wanted to share with you ju just a few. All of you who attend the campaigns, you know you can fill up three sermon slots just by telling stories. And I'm not going to do that. But I did want to share three, three quick examples for you to encourage your heart. The first one I want us to think about is a man, well, some of you know Ron Wilson. Ron w Wilson was on, a, on my team, my door knocking team. I got to be a, a co-captain last year. And as we were driving around, it was getting about lunchtime. And I don't know if you know this, in summertime in Texas, it gets hot. Um, Everybody was hot. Everybody was tired. Everybody was thirsty. We were ready to eat. And so me and Brad Vaughn, my co-captain, we decided that it was time for us to get our door knockers back on the van and head back to the building. And as we were circling around telling everybody, come get on the van, I rolled down my window and I said, Ron, let's go ahead and load up and go to lunch. And he looked at me, pointed his finger, and he said, no. I thought he just disobeyed me. I'm not, I'm not sure how I'm supposed to handle this. And he said, I know that it'll be a long time before we get to come back to these houses because there's just a couple more left on the street. He said, let me go and knock out these last two and then I'll get in the van. And I thought, okay, I'll ride around the air conditioning while you do that. And he was gone for a while. And I began thinking, well, Ron sure likes to talk, doesn't he? Well, as he begins to come back to the van, he was telling us why it took him so long. That as he knocked on the door, him with his partner that was knocking with him, and they just had their Bibles tucked under their arm. A young lady opened the door and just started crying. No words were spoken, and she said, thank God that you're here. Ron was a little taken back by that, and he asked her why she had said that, and she said, I know you will not believe me, but me and my sister were just in the living room praying that God show us what he wants us to do with our life. And Ron said, today's your lucky day. We got another driver to come and pick up these two young ladies and the, and, the, and the child that they were watching and bring them back to the building. They had lunch with us. And later that day, after separate Bible studies, both of them became your sisters in Christ. I think about another man by the name of Matthew. Matthew was baptized into Christ on Wednesday of our campaign. After a long study, he had made that decision to become a child of God, and he stayed up late on Wednesday night with the man who studied with him, with his own set of Bibles, learning how to mark his Bibles to teach a study. And on Thursday morning, he was on my door knocking team, knocking doors in his community, asking people to study with him. Evangelism is not dead. I think about a woman by the name of Maria. Maria was a sweet lady. She was a sweet lady who was trying her entire life to live for Jesus. 
And just like you are here this morning because you love the Lord, she loved the Lord and she agreed to a Bible study. Who doesn't want to study their Bible more? Whenever it was revealed to her that maybe her salvation was not as sure as she had once thought that it was, she made that commitment to Christ as well and had her sins washed away in baptism. Maria was 89 years old. There was a man on campaign. He was not converted on campaign. He was one of our workers. His name was Michael Hyman. Michael was on my team, and he was just full of energy. And I was asking him towards the end of the week, how do you still have energy? You've been working harder than I am, and I'm exhausted. How do you still have energy? And he started telling me about his conversion story. He started telling me about how it was that he came to hear the gospel. And he was telling me that he was going to another campaign right after this one, and another one right after this one. And I'm sitting there thinking, I can't make it through tomorrow. And I said, Michael, how do you have enough energy to do all of this? And I will never, as long as I live, forget what he said. As he looked me right in the eyes and he said, Troy, I have to spend my life telling people what I almost never heard. Church, if that, if that doesn't hit your heart, I'm not sure if you have a pulse this morning. I have to spend my life telling people what I almost never heard. As we look at these examples and many others, you, you all could share several yourself. I want you to notice that these are not examples from the 1950s. These are not examples from Acts chapter 2. These are not examples from uh, whenever we read about the explosion of the church in the first century. These are modern examples that are happening of people who are hungry for the Word of God. Evangelism is not dead. Amen, church? I'll give you two brief reasons why evangelism is not dead. Number one, evangelism is not dead because the Word of God is living and active. And Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, the Hebrew writer writes, For the word of God is living and active. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of the soul and of spirit and of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. Evangelism is not dead. Another reason why evangelism is not dead is because of this, because the fields, I believe, are still white. In John chapter 4, we read of an amazing story where Jesus is talking to the, the woman at the well who had been involved with sinful relationships, and he begins to tell her all of these things about herself, and she was amazed by this conversation she had been having with Jesus. And the text says that she, she left to go into the city and to tell all of the townspeople, come and see a man who told me all that I've ever done. And it says that they were coming out to see him. They were coming out to see Jesus, and then we read these words in John chapter 4, verse 35. Do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for the harvest. Something that we need to understand as we study this passage is that at this time, the clothing, they didn't have all the beautiful array of colors like you and I are wearing today. Most of their clothing was white. It was inexpensive. It might be dusty from, from, the, from the dirt outside, but they were white garments. Now, I want you to picture that scene in your mind as Jesus was doing what he had to do with his disciples over and over again, turning their minds from the physical things to the spiritual. And he says, you're worried about physical food and about the harvest. I want you to look at all these people coming in their white garments. That's the field that's white for the harvest. As we begin to think about the fields that you and I are surrounded with, I would submit to you that the fields are still white for the harvest. I say that because there is a, a whole new generation that is coming up that they have a lot of questions, and that's a good thing. It's a good thing that they have a lot of questions because the Bible has the answers, amen? And whenever we, we begin to think about all the questions that people have in their life, questions are not the enemy. Looking in the wrong place can be deadly. It is my job, it is your job to turn people to the solution, to the only place that can answer all of those questions. There's a whole world of people that want to know the truth. Satan will try to tell you that they don't care about truth, and that couldn't be more false. They do care about truth, but they don't know it. And it's up to you and I to teach them that. See, number one on your outline this morning was that evangelism is not dead, and I hope that with some of the things that I've said briefly that I've encouraged your hearts just a little bit. I also want to challenge us this morning. Number two on your outline is this, that evangelism is not an option. It's not an option. See, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 1, the Apostle Paul, writing to the church in Corinth, he, he tells them to imitate 
me. But he doesn't stop there. He doesn't say, imitate me, because I'm a good person to imitate. He says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. The blueprint for our life is laid out for us in this one verse. That everything that we do, the words that we use, the way that we treat each other, our priorities in life, it needs to line up with the life of Christ. He is our pattern for life. You know the scriptures. In Luke 19 and verse 10, we find that Jesus came to find and to save the sinners. One of his purposes, primary missions on this earth, was to find those who were lost and to save them. That's my mission because I'm a Christian. All of you that have made the decision to be a New Testament Christian, that is your job in life, is to fulfill the purpose of Christ by seeking and saving those that are lost. Uh, too many Christians today say to themselves, or maybe even out loud, I can do a lot of things for the church, but evangelism is not one of them. Maybe you've said that. You've at least heard that. But I can do a lot of different things, but I, but I, can't, I can't evangelize. Too many people will have excuses that are a mile long. Here's a few. I'm too young. I'm too young, and I might be studying with somebody who's older than me, and they're not going to listen. Well, I'm too old, and people are going to think that I can't relate anymore, and they're not going to listen. People don't want to hear about the Bible, so why should I spend my time trying to teach them? I don't know enough. What if somebody asks me a question, and I don't know the answer? I might as well just stay out of it, or I'm sure you've never heard this. I'm too busy. I've got a lot of things going on in my life. My job keeps me tied up. I've got a lot of responsibilities at home. I have so many issues going on within my life. I don't have time to talk to somebody who's outside of Christ about how to enter into a saved relationship. I'm just too busy in my life. My, my knee hurts. I've got a headache. Any excuse that I can come up with to justify me not being involved, that'll satisfy me. I want to tell you that for years, some of those excuses, they fit me. Those are reasons that I would give why I'm not going to ask this person if they'll study with me. Last year at San Angelo, there was a man by the name of Jim Vinson. Uh, several of you probably remember him. Uh, he left an impression on my heart. Uh, Jim was on uh, my door knocking team. He was in his mid-70s. And he had just had surgery on both of his feet. He had shattered the bones in his feet. He had taken a severe fall. And he had to wear these shoes that were two times too big for his feet in order for his braces to fit in them. Now, in that condition, he would crawl in the very back of that blue van that we have in our parking lot to go knock on those doors with us every day. And here I am sitting up in the nice captain's seat, and I would feel about this big, right? In many days, I, w I would crawl in the back so he wouldn't have to. But I began thinking about this man and how he wouldn't miss a day of door knocking because he, he would continually say, this door, there might be a soul for Jesus. This door, there might be a soul for Jesus. After, after a day or a morning, excuse me, of hard work, he had gotten a phone call on our way back to the church building for lunch informing him that a water line had burst at his house. And he said, I may not be back this afternoon. I've got to go home and uh, shut that water off and dig out a new trench and all of this. And we're getting close to the end of the week. And I said, Jim, you have done so much. Uh, don't, don't worry about it. Take care of what you need to take care of. He was back that afternoon, and he didn't miss any time. And I began looking at a man such as that who was in so much pain, could barely walk, but yet he refused to quit. And I looked at him and thought, what excuse do I have? I don't have any. I don't have any excuse to... to refrain from doing what the Lord has called me to do. I want to be clear about something this morning. Romans chapter 12 and 1 Corinthians chapter 12, both great passages of Scripture that teach us that not all of us have the same abilities. I'm aware of that. God has blessed each one of us in, in unique ways. Some of us can do some things while some of us can do other things. And the group over here may not be good at anything over here. And I understand that. I want to share something with you that Monty Jennings shared with me soon after I moved here. I don't want any of you to tell him this because I don't want to inflate his ego, but uh, I, I would often, as he would come into my office and sit down and visit with me, as he would exit my office, I would start writing down some of the things he had to say because I didn't want to forget it. And I kept an electronic file entitled Moments with Monty, and one of those moments with Monty that I want to share with you is this. Monty said, there's not an excuse for any individual who claims to be a Christian to not be involved with evangelism. He said there are two different models that you can follow. He gave the example of what he called the Philip model. 
from Acts chapter 8. You're familiar with this. Where there was a man who was riding the, the eunuch, and he was studying the scriptures, but he needed some help in his understanding. And he needed somebody to guide him. He said, there, that, that's one model, is we have a bunch of Phillips in this congregation. A bunch of people that, are, that can guide somebody from where they are to the cross. Somebody who can, who can guide them from where they are to where they need to be spiritually. That's one method of evangelism. That's one model. And he said the other model that the Bible gives us is the Cornelius model in Acts chapter 10. You see, even before Cornelius was a Christian, when he was still outside of Christ, he was fulfilling this model. We don't have any record in Scripture indicating that Cornelius ever studied the Bible, that Cornelius ever baptized anybody, that he was responsible for their conversion. But here's what we do know about Cornelius. When he knew that the apostle was coming to preach, he went out and gathered the town to come hear him. Whenever he knew that the gospel was going to be taught, even though he wasn't the one doing the teaching, he went out to find people to come and to be taught. You see, every one of us can be involved in evangelism in one of those two models. Being willing to sit down with somebody and guide them through scripture, or saying, you know what, I'm not confident in that, but I can go get people and bring them to you. There is no excuse for any Christian to not be involved in some way in evangelism. Amen, church? My Savior, your Savior, came to this earth for the purpose of seeking and saving those that, that are lost. That needs to be my purpose. You know, we live today in a very specialized society. What I mean by that is we have specialists for everything. Whenever, uh, when, whenever an, an appliance goes down in your kitchen, um, most of the time you can't just call uh, just anybody to have that repaired. You've got to call somebody who specializes in that. You've got to call somebody that specializes in all sorts of different things today because that's the society that we live in. And I'm afraid that too many times we fall into that mindset within the church that we're going to leave evangelism to the specialist. We're going to leave it to those that have been trained. We're going to leave it to those that, that, that know the most. And I want to take just a moment to brag on, on this congregation and say thank you because I, I, it's evident that's not your mentality. It's evident that this congregation does not believe it's just the minister's job or it's just the elder's job, that you understand it's your job. It's all of us that we have this responsibility to bring souls to Christ. And I'm so thankful for that because the other model of leaving it to the specialist, I can promise you, will never, ever work. And it will never work because it's not God's plan. God's plan is for each one of us to be plugged in to evangelism. I truly believe that this congregation is filled with some of the greatest people on this planet. We have people that love the Lord. We have people that will sacrifice vacation time to go and teach complete strangers the gospel. We have teenagers that will attend and knock on doors, set up Bible studies, and teach them, whereas most other places you can't find teenagers who are willing to hold a Bible. This congregation is special. But regardless of what our involvement has been in the past with campaigns or day-to-day -day activities with evangelizing, I want to challenge you to do more. I want to challenge you to be higher. There might be some that are sitting here that you realize that you have never been involved in the work of this congregation as far as evangelism is concerned. I beg you this morning to change that. God calls you to change that to be involved in bringing lost souls to Christ. But I also re recognize that there might be somebody in here this morning that themselves have never decided to follow Jesus. It's really hard to lead somebody where you're not going. It's really hard to teach somebody what you don't know. If there's someone here this morning and you realize that you are outside of Christ, you've, you're still carrying your sins, we'd love to start with you this morning. We'd love to help you. We'd love to pray with you, study with you baptize you into Christ to have your sins taken away. But there might be someone else who is a Christian and you realize you haven't been who God has called you to be and you want to change. If there's any spiritual need that this congregation can help you with, whether by prayers, studying, encouraging, we'd invite you to come. While together we stand and we sing the song of invitation.